this one. Now, let's go to radio for a little bit. Uh, because Hall always has such a legal issues with radio. Uh, let's start with the most, the, the biggest one, uh, in fact. Uh, you, you know, Justice we, Department versus Pacifica, Pacifica Radio regarding the Paul Gorman's broadcast. Okay. Now let's let's, let's be clear about this. You cannot, you, you never say on television. Let's be clear about this because this is a very fascinating. People get it. People get the history wrong. History, Everybody gets it wrong. In the, the history, Billy. Let me go backwards. Um, uh, some preacher heard that this was happening, and he and he was in California. He's in California. But the real trick was that Paul Gorman. What he did is not that he played the record once. He kept on playing the. Cut. That's not true. No, he didn't. So what's, no, he what, didn't. What, what's, what's the real story? He played it at Saturday at two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. But the, but the per, they, they say the person who that was the problem. The person who heard it was a member of a moral majority group, which is always tuning into BAI and other Pacifica stations and looking to to entrap us. What year was this again? Uh, 70, no, later. Like, 70, uh, the actual broadcast, I think, is about 75. The court case was um, 78? Uh, 77, 78, right after the famed 77 crisis okay. at BAI. Okay, well, so let's, let's go. So, 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 what happened? so, uh, so basically, the, uh, um, the FCC fined us. Uh, we appealed through a FCC legal group, Fox, Aaron, somebody or other, and they actually, today, nowadays, represent CBS, Fox Network. They're huge, and they're huge because of us. Mm -hmm. Um, which sort of helped it easy that I don't think we ever fully properly um, paid them, but they became huge as a result, so they haven't come after us. So after us, no, they should they should give us some sort of reciprocity. I mean, some sort of uh, what do you call it? Well, technically, we owe them about two million dollars. Oh, please, hey, give, forgive that a uh, debt jubilee. And, oh, I, I and, think they have give. I think they have forgiven. Yeah, I'm saying point. they should, but they should be paying us a little bit every because of their the dream on. <laughs> So, um, anyhow, they're First Amendment lawyers, basically. Mm -hmm. And they represented us, and technically, they lost the case. But we weren't fined much of anything. Everybody says, oh, it cost us all this money. No, it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, the, font, there was, well, the, the FCC fine was not upheld. And the FCC was furious about that. Because... At the, what the Carlin case ended up saying was basically, I think, a very smart decision. It said that, yes, we have freedom of speech. Yes, you can't abridge it. But on the other hand, you have to be responsible well, yeah. how you use it. So you don't yell fire, fire in a crowded fire. theater, mm -hmm. and you don't broadcast a language of uh, indecent language, and by the way, it's not about the seven words. Mm -hmm. It never has been. This is something that many people at Pacifica still don't understand. It's not those words. In fact, several of those words are permissible. Some of them are redundant, even. <laughs> uh, yes, they are, as Carlin says in his routine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, you can say ass on the air. Yeah. You can say that you're pissed off. Yeah. Uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, William Shatner starred in a TV show called Shit, My Father Says. Yeah. You know, it's all a question of context. Or as George Carlin said, you can prick your finger, but you can't finger your prick. <laughs> It's not, a, right, that, that's Carlin, yeah, yeah. the sage yeah. at work there. Brilliant, yeah. It's, he was brilliant. And so it's not about those seven words. It's about what the FCC loosely calls indecent language. Mm. So, um, and yet there's indecent language all the time, all over broadcasting and radio. And people think, oh, that's not one of the seven words. But that doesn't matter. You can read a pornographic passage from Lady Chatterley's Lover, which will have none of that language in it, and you will be breaking the law if you do it hmm. at a certain time of day. So what the Supreme Court says was, this was a Saturday at 2 o'clock, and if you had, forget the guy who was pretty fake to begin with, mm -hmm. forget the guy who uh, brought the case to the FCC, uh, and uh, and then the Justice Department. What they did was they said 
At two o'clock in the afternoon, if you park a five-year-old in front of the radio and somebody comes on the radio and says, the following program contains frank language. If you are offended by frank language, please tune out and rejoin us in one hour when we'll have something more suitable. A five-year-old doesn't know what that means. Mm. That five-year-old is going to stay tuned. Mm. So the Supreme Court decided that BAI was injudicious in broadcasting this on a Saturday at 2 o'clock. And that is why we lost this. Not because of freedom of speech. We won that. Most broadcasters consider the Carlin case a major win. Because it created what in England they copied us. They called it the watershed time, 10 to 6. And in the US, it created what is called Safe Harbor. And it was determined what Safe Harbor was because our lawyers wrote a clerk of the Supreme Court. There was no case, but just said, well, what if we put this on at 7 p.m.? And the Supreme Court. The judgment was that would be wrong. What if we did it at midnight? Well, I don't have a problem with that. And so going back and forth, they came up with 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And I decided to have fun and have a test case. So what I did, well, I didn't want a test case. I just wanted to do it. Yeah, on, on program Hour of the Wolf. Now, on Hour of the Wolf. Hour of the Wolf came on like, but Hour of the Wolf starts, starts at, did it start at 5? 5. 5 yeah. to 7 a.m. is yeah. the Hour of the Wolf, according yeah, to Yeah, because I used to, I, I, I used to wake up all the time just so, because I love the way you, I love you reading to me. So I used to wake up just so, you know, Jim Foyne could read to me in my, in my, in my boudoir. I, I am still doing that. <laughs> but not during the Hour of the Wolf anymore, but I'm not gonna change the name of the program at this time, it's branded, yeah. and, and I've created Hour of the Wolf in Corp Productions. Mm -hmm. and so anything I do will be branded Hour of the Wolf from now on, no matter when it's on. Mm -hmm. so, so, so just like No More Radio, whenever that's happening, No More Radio happens whenever I yeah, want Yeah, except that. that Hour of the Wolf refers to an actual time of day. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, yeah. it's after a movie by Ingmar Bergman called Vartin, which translates to wolf time, or hour of the wolf. And it's an ancient Roman belief that there is a time of day during which more children are born, more people die, and which dreams are effective. And that is the hour of the wolf. Wow. Okay, so That's an ancient thing. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we made up. Okay, so now, Bob, so you, so you, your inadvertent test situation. It wasn't inadvertent, it was okay. advertent. I forgot I'm talking to Jim Florin, that means that everything is deliberate, but go well, ahead. Well, no, no. But yes, what, but yes, what yes, happened, we can argue about this, we can arm wrestle about this, but yes, 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 okay? No, nah, it's louder than extemporaneous. <laughs> I mean, I may know what I'm doing when I'm doing it, but I didn't know I was going to do it three seconds earlier. Mm. <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, now we're back to technicalities, but go ahead. Yeah, so anyway, uh, uh, I recorded the great Harlan Ellison doing a reading at the School of Visual Arts, and he was locked in a room with a painting that was done for him by Leo and Diane Dillon, two artists at the School of Visual Arts. Mm -hmm. And he had to write in, he had like five hours in which to write a short story based on that painting, and he did. It was called Shatterday, which was eventually, by the way, made into a Twilight Zone, starring Bruce Willis. Mm. But before that, Harlan wrote it in one day and then read the story aloud. And he's a brilliant reader. At least he was then. Today he's... Well, what what year was that? Uh, this is... 77 or 78. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, hmm, no. Joseph, I can tell you this, Larry Josephson was the station manager. So we can probably figure out you know, within two years. It might have been a little earlier. Okay. But whenever it was, it's, after, it's not long after the Carlin decision comes down. Mm -hmm. And it took a year and a half to get to the Carlin decision. Mm -hmm. It might have even been 76. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, okay. Excuse mm. me. But at any rate, the uh, Harlan Ellison, for those who are familiar with his work, and many, many people are, including what many people call the best episode of Star Trek ever, called The City on the Edge of Forever. Mm. Um, he's, he's got a mouth on him, okay? Mm. He uses language, and he uses it very freely and openly, and I think that he would increase George Carlin's vocabulary no small amount. And this story certainly did so. But mm. there is a point in the story where the narrator of the story, for reasons involving fantastic and science fictional reasons, calms down. Mm. So it's about a 45 minute story, and the first half hour is just filled with language. Mm. And then the last 15 minutes is not. So what I did was I started broadcasting the story. I back-timed it so that I started at around 5.30 and so that the last curse word went over the air at like 5.59. Mm -hmm. But the, st the story went past the safe harbor mm -hmm. into 6 to 6.15, but there were no naughty words after 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. But it didn't take long. We were slapped with somebody, probably the same person, complaining that we broadcast blah, blah, blah. And it was on. And uh, the Josephson, Larry was not happy. Hmm. And, uh, but I had gotten permission from him that you know it had all this language, but that that would end by 6 a.m. Hmm. And he's furious with me, and he says, uh, look at all these words and he's holding the actual thing I guess either the FCC or the Justice Department or whoever and my FCC license I think was suspended. Yeah that's, that's when we had to actually have FCC licenses. <laughs> yeah that's right. Third class radio broadcast. With, with radio endorsement right broadcast endorsement yep. and um, I said well, I told you that it had shit and fuck and this word and that word in it. And he said, you didn't tell me it had the word motherfucker. <laughs> and I said, what? I was very intimidated wow. by Larry. I said, what's the difference? And he's red in the face and he's screaming at me saying, you don't know that it's worst. To, uh, you've never heard of the incest taboo? And I thought he was using incest taboo, like a capital I and capital T, like one would say Carlin decision, like this was a legal thing. And I say, no. I've never heard of it. You know, I didn't know about that. And he gets redder in the face. He says, you don't know that it's worse to fuck your mother than it is to fuck your girlfriend. Uh, and... You know, the whole thing gets turned over to the lawyers. The lawyers are, del they're delighted. They think this is great because this is, this we can win because Safe Harbor has been determined and I didn't break it, but they were coming after us anyway so they can prove harassment. Mm. And what's more, Harlan Ellison was at the time the vice president of the Writers Guild of America, which is for screenwriters as opposed to the Authors Guild. Uh, Harlan is a big name. He had three long columns and who's two. Today it's probably seven or eight. He's in his 80s. But he's still turning out stuff, including audiobooks now. And he, um, uh, full disclosure with people that I work with, and he uh, was so excited. He said, man, I am going to go in front of the fucking Supreme Court and I'm going to tell that Justice Burger where he can put his robes where the sun don't shine and we're going to get this person to testify and that person to testify and on and on and on. You know, and and uh, the lawyers come back with like two or three days later, they write their brief, they file it, and the Justice Department declines to prosecute because they recognize that if they do prosecute, this might well be seen as harassment. Mm -hmm. So, I'm reinstated. The case is dropped. And, and, and you uh, are a footnote in history, in and broadcast I am, history. I am a minor footnote in broadcast history, except for one thing. Ellison was so pissed off at me. 
he was like, I, I blew his chance <laughs> to talk in front of the Supreme Court. You know, he was going to get Vonnegut, he was going to get Carlin, he was going to get everybody. You, you know how these things work. You don't get to testify. Your lawyers get to do briefs and stuff like that, and the judges ask questions. Well, that's not what he is. He was seeing stardom. He was seeing immortality. In no, the uh, of Carlin has immortality. No, I meant in the annals yeah, of Yeah, I know, but, the, but this history. would have added to it. And he, he was not happy, and um, I got the... Uh, uh, my ears are still burning from... This is before email. I'm, my ears are still burning from the phone calls mm. that I was getting collect. I should say, when it meant something to get a collect call from California. Uh, so, so that's that part of broadcast history. <laughs> Thank you.